In 1933, Adolf Hitler grabbed control of a nation. He bent the people to his will, and one of his weapons was this motion picture. At the same time, in some parts of America, men were broken by lash and shackle, barbaric holdovers from the Dark Ages. Then a Hollywood movie exposing the brutality and inhumanity of the chain gang seared the national conscience. Both pictures live to this day, the evil and the good, classic examples of the awesome power of the angry screen. You're next. I'm innocent. For my wife and my children, I swear, I'm innocent. On the back lot of a Hollywood studio, an American movie company recreates a dark moment of French history and delivers a powerful sermon against censorship and bigotry. This is one way the movies influence the mind. The social protest, or message picture, speaks out freely on issues, conditions, ideas. Long live France! I'm innocent! And this is propaganda. The classic example of film artistry in slavish obedience to the economic and political goals of a state. Of all the ways man has devised to communicate, None can match the power of the motion picture to reach the mind, the emotions, the imagination, and in extreme cases, even the will. Since their very beginning, motion pictures have mirrored the changing world. In the early 1900s, movies quickly become the most universal form of mass information. Before long, the screen begins to preach. Social ills are popular themes for early flickers. Heavy-handed melodramas like Over the Hill to the Poor House set the pattern for most Hollywood message films that follow. Soon, the outright propaganda film appears. One of the earliest shows a crooked politician taking money from a fat plutocrat representing the big trucks. To cure this terrible situation, says the film, send Woodrow Wilson to the White House. In 1915, D.W. Griffith explodes a bombshell, the birth of a nation. It is perhaps the most potent film of all time. President Wilson says it is like writing history with lightning. But Griffith's history springs from his own boyhood in the Deep South. His film portrays Negroes as drunken louts or vicious subhuman beasts. And these scenes condoning the hate-filled savagery of the Ku Klux Klan cause nationwide controversy. During the Roaring Twenties, much of Hollywood, like much of America, concentrates on life's simple pleasures booze, jazz, and razzmatazz. Pictures like Flaming Youth, The Joy Girl, and many others bring charges that Hollywood is leading the nation down the primrose path. But movie makers reply that they are unbiased reporters, merely showing what goes on in the average American community. The Bubble Birth. The country is dragged into the mire of grinding depression. 
And Hollywood begins to reflect the nation's changing mood during the grim 30s. Jobless men become the heroes of a string of depression pictures. Usually, they are decorated veterans of the First World War, unjustly convicted of crimes they did not commit. They also wind up as heroes of grim prison pictures. This cycle begins with a milestone in movie history. I am a fugitive from a chain gang. A hard-hitting expose that sparks outraged demands for prison reform. Come on, pull them through! I Am a Fugitive also serves as a springboard for the distinguished film career of Paul Muni. Through the 30s, his screen characters personify man in his unending struggle for human rights. As a hungry young lawyer in border town, he suffers the barbs of prejudice against Mexican-Americans. In Black Fury, he is an immigrant coal miner, duped by labor racketeers into betraying his fellow workers. As Louis Pasteur, he scores a gripping triumph for reason and enlightenment, and wins an Academy Award. As the Mexican hero, Benito Juarez, he leads his oppressed people to freedom from foreign rule. And as Emil Zola, he crusades against ignorance and bigotry. Not only is an innocent man crying out for justice, but more, much more, a great nation is in desperate danger of forfeiting her honor. Do not take upon yourselves a fault, the burden of which you will forever bear in history. A judicial blunder has been committed. The condemnation of an innocent man induced the acquittal of a guilty man. During the turbulent 30s, Warner Brothers leads the industry in producing pictures that inform and arouse while they entertain. Combining good citizenship with good picture making is the studio's proud slogan. Warner's scriptwriters fire their shots in many directions. Backroom political shenanigans are exposed in the dark horse. We're going to convince the voters that at last they're getting one of their own kind to represent them. <laughs> Honest and dumb. That's the bill of goods we're going to sell, and it's a bill that can't fail. Sure he's dumb, but he's honest. A square shooter, on the level. A man like your next door neighbor. Yes. Edward G. Robinson gets his fill of yellow journalism in Five Star Final. Sure, it's a great story. Sure, give it the works. Plaster it all over the front page. Get an extra out if you want to. Say, paint it on the front of the building. Tattoo it on Hinchcliffe's chest. I don't care what you do with him, because I'm not working here anymore. No, Hinchcliffe's got to get himself a new head butcher. I've had 10 years of filth and blood. I'm splashed with it, drenched with it. I've had all I can stand, plenty of it. Take your dumb ass killing to Hinchcliffe with my compliments and tell him to shove it up his... Why did we get fired? What put us out of work? <laughs> That's right, the machines did it. The machines ruined us. They grabbed our jobs away. They wrecked our homes. As early as 1933, Heroes for Sale warns of technological unemployment. Today, we call it automation. Smash the machines! It's been smashing you! Come on, let's go! Come on down, Hale. We've been waiting for you for a long time. Come on, Hale! Ain't nobody gonna commute your sentence now. Come on, Hale! Don't take me back! Please, please, give me a chance! Give me a chance! Please, don't take me back! No, no. The blind hatred of a lynch mob is grippingly laid bare in They Won't Forget. A resurgence of the Ku Klux Klan inspires the sensational Black Legion.
aimless, embittered young men are romanticized in a string of pictures. When they get into trouble, somehow it's never their own fault. Always society is to blame. It's not his fault, Father. He was just a kid who, who made a mistake. Got sent to reform school. They made a criminal out of him. But he's not bad. Not really bad. All he ever needed was a break. I guess there are a lot of boys like Joe Bell running around desperately groping for a chance. Rockhart told me you were a slum kid who never had a chance. But so was Frank. He hates crooked cops and rotten politicians just as much as you do. Now, many of those men are here just because they had bad breaks. They're not born criminals, and we don't want to turn them into criminals. If you want to do something for these boys, why don't you clean up the slums? Why don't you give them a decent place to live in? Give them some of the things other boys have in life. I'm not a responsible member of their society. I'm a bindle step, a tramp. What I do, what I think, what I feel, what happens to me, don't bother them that much. They read about guys like me and then forget them. As far as they're concerned, I don't exist. I'm a nobody with a capital N. Remember my forgotten man? You put a rifle in his hand. You sent him far away. You shouted, hip hooray. But look at him today. The message is even set to music. In Gold Diggers of 1933, Joan Blondell and a cast of thousands lament the Depression blues. years of Adolf Hitler's Third Reich produced the most skillful and insidious of all film propaganda. This is Triumph of the Will, ostensibly a documentary record of the first Nazi Congress in Nuremberg. Actually, the entire rally was designed and staged for some 30-odd cameras under the brilliant direction of a former actress, Leni Reifenstahl. The more than 100,000 Germans in the stadium are mere pawns. Not delegates to a convention, but extras in the filming of an awe-inspiring Wagnerian spectacle. The three-hour film has an almost hysterical effect upon German audiences, who are ready to accept their Fuhrer as a god and Nazism as the one true religion. Building up the image of the Nazi Superman, the German propaganda machine also attacks those Hitler would destroy. First, the Jews. In the Nazi view, all countries that oppose Hitler are controlled by an international Jewish conspiracy. The British are denounced as hypocrites. Missionaries who dispense the gospel of Christ with one hand and deadly weapons with the other.
The Nazis prepare for their rape of Poland by picturing a young German maiden as the innocent victim of a lustful, bloodthirsty Polish mob. <laughs> The Nazis picture America as one vast slum, a degenerate nation, they say, with a Jewish president who gleefully carves up the world for his own pleasure. Many in the U.S. remain blind to the Hitler menace, even when the German-American Bund stages mass rallies in Madison Square Garden and its stormtroopers answer hecklers with blackjack. In 1939, in the face of great economic and political pressure, Warner Brothers takes a courageous step. It produces the factual expose, Confessions of a Nazi Spy, and awakens the nation to the dangers of the Bund as Hitler's fifth column in America. Germans must save America from the chaos that breeds in democracy and racial equality. We Germans must make the United States unser America. Our America! Lima! 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 Months after Pearl Harbor, the Japanese swallow up their bombs with propaganda. This film glorifies the sneak attack. It uses miniature ship models, but unsophisticated Japanese audiences cannot recognize this transparent fraud. When the nation goes to war, Hollywood studios produce training films for the armed forces, while entertainment pictures are shipped overseas to build morale. The movies spur the war effort with patriotic films such as Sergeant York, starring Gary Cooper, and Yankee Doodle Dandy with James Cagney as George M. Cohan. Throughout the Second World War, hundreds of films reduce global conflict to simple cliches. First, Brother Ratch, you take a few orders from me. Get them up. It's a great pity, Mr. Donahue, that you and I should oppose each other. We have so much in common. Yeah, how's that? You are men of action. You take what you want, and so do we. You have no respect for democracy. Neither do we. It's clear we should be allies. It's clear you are screwy. I've been a registered Democrat ever since I could vote. You Americans are so soft and stupid. It's a pity you're so arrogant. We Germans don't talk. We act. Thank you, miss, for bringing the army to us. We shall be waiting for it. You're the bartender at the Casa Marina. Yes, for many years. Willie's plans are always lonely plans. Come up. I remember Mike's pride when he bought the first pair of roller skates for his little five-year-old boy. There are lots of Mike's dying right now. And a lot more Mike's will die. Until we wipe out a system that puts daggers in the hands of five-year-old children. If Mike were here to put it into words right now, that's just about what he dies for. More roller skates in this world. Men, remember Pearl Harbor. After the war, Hollywood gains new maturity. Subjects once considered taboo are discussed with dramatic frankness, and the screen provides serious insight into basic human problems. The best years of our lives examine veterans' readjustment to civilian life. The lost weekend reveals the tortures of alcoholism. And the snake pit awakens the nation to deplorable conditions in mental hospitals. Gentlemen's Agreement attacks anti-Semitism. And my son John exposes communist subversion. Bigotry aimed at the American Negro is probed in films like Intruder in the Dust, Lost Boundary, and Home of the Brave. It's not your fault. You didn't ask for it. It's a legacy. 150 years of slavery, of second-class citizenship, of being different. You had that feeling of difference pounded into you when you were a child. 
And being a child, you turned it into a feeling of guilt. You always had that guilt inside you. In the film's gripping climax, army psychiatrist Jeff Corey desperately tries to shock G.I. James Edwards out of his hysterical paralysis. Boss, get up and walk. Oh, you dirty nigger, get up and walk. For the first time in 40 years, the movies examined the growing problem of drug addiction in The Man with a Golden Arm, starring Frank Sinatra and Darren McGavin. Monkey is never dead, dealer. The monkey never dies. Can you kick him off? He just hides in a corner waiting his turn. years find a new enemy aiming propaganda films at the U.S. Kremlin stooges in communist East Germany feed their enslaved people this distorted version of life in America. The narration refers to social and economic problems of post-war America, but the pictures are newsreel shots of the Great Depression in the early 30s. Shown to audiences unaware of the deception, these films become powerful anti-American weapons. The Soviet Union continually distorts America's race problem in feature films sent to uncommitted nations around the world. These scenes, they imply, show typical behavior of American GIs stationed in Europe. men's minds goes on. And in this war, film is a powerful weapon that can be used for good or evil. George Orwell's savage anti-communist satire titled 1984 projects the ultimate evil, total control of the human will. screen should sound the alarm against those who would destroy freedom. For in its power to deceive and inflame, or enlighten and inspire, the motion picture has no equal. Viva! 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 